Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Carlos El Tala. We were gonna today present uh, basically our posters at the ACC, <coughs> the upcoming ACC in March. Uh, all of them are gonna be, I think, flat board posters only, not oral. <coughs> so basically, I'm gonna start, it's gonna be very quick. I'm gonna start with uh, my case. The title is Severe Aortic Insufficiency is a patient in a patient with perimembranous ventricular septal defect not the usual sus suspect. <clears throat> so, as we know that uh, the association between VSD and AI is well known. Uh, the two most common VSDs, or the two only probably VSDs associated with AI are perimembranous VSD and subpulmonary VSD. The subpulmonary VSD is the least common type of, VSD, of, uh, of VSDs. However, it's the most known to be associated with aortic insufficiency, the mechanism being the prolapse of the, in case of a subpulmonary at least, is the prolapse of the right coronary cusp into the defect during systole by the Venturi effect, causing uh, during diastole some regurgitation. Uh, when it comes to perimembranous VSD, which is the most common type of VSD, uh, the, the mechanism is basically the same. However, it can involve, because of the anatomic location of the VSD being posterior, it can involve the, either the non-coronary cusp or the right coronary cusp. However, it has been uh, published or mentioned in the literature, at least when I, when I did my search, that also in uh, perimembranous VSD, another association is uh, with uh, abnormal aortic valve morphology which can also lead to AI. So it's not necessarily a cusp prolapse. So usually the described morphology, abnormal morphology, is by cuspid aortic valve. Here we're presenting a, I'm gonna present a case of perimembranous VSD with associated severe AI due a quadricuspid aortic valve. During my quick search in the literature, I didn't find any other uh, similar at least case. Uh, so our patient is a 40 year old. A uh, male who presented with basically symptoms of heart failure mainly, dyspnea on exertion. Uh, his physical exam, he couldn't, he was, he was known to have a VSD as a child, but he couldn't follow it up due to socioeconomic reasons. On physical exams, he had four over six systolic, three over six diastolic murmurs. I'm sorry, I don't have the characteristics of the murmur because this was taken from the, from the chart. Initially, as usual, a transthoracic echocardiogram was performed. It showed severe AI, a perimembranous VSD, and LV enlargement and dysfunction. However, as you know, in transthoracic, usually specifically in these situations, it's not always easy to uh, elucidate the mechanism of, of the severe AI and how, how VSD is associated with it. So a TEE was performed afterward. It confirmed uh, the severe AI again, and then associated perimembranous VSD. And here you can see in this, image, uh, LA, LV, the VSD defect, you can see it here. And when you add color, you see during diastole the severe aortic regurgitation, at least by color, with the left to right shunt through the VSD. <coughs> Again, if, if this was a cusp prolapse, you should at least expect some tissue to be, uh, you know, the cusp being seen here, uh, going through the VSD, which, which is not at least obvious here. Uh, a modified view of that long axis view of the heart, which show, showed uh, that the aortic valve morphology was not normal. So you see a cusp prolapse, a posteriorly located cusp that is prolapsing into the uh, LVOT. And if the VSD is here, you see it's, it's not at the same location, it's on the opposite side. So you can get an idea that in this case, they're not the AI and the VSD are not necessarily uh, related in terms of cause and effect. <clears throat> On the short axis view, uh, the quad a quadricuspid valve was appreciated, as you can see here, bearing uh, three equally sized leaflets and a small posterior located smaller leaflet, uh, which most likely is the pro it was the prolapsing uh, segment that we have seen before and probably causing the AI. Uh, the VSD by color Doppler, by the way, was measured at seven millimeters uh, by the color Doppler width on the TEE. 
So this patient has very strong indications for aortic valve repair. He had severe AI, he was symptomatic, he has LV dysfunction, LV enlargement, all of these. However, the VSD and its contribution to all this scenario was not entirely clear because it looked small. Was it, was it contributing to volume or was it just uh, a bystander, restrictive VSD maybe? Uh, most likely it is not causing the AI, at least that's what we know. So he went for surgery and during uh, intraoperatively, <coughs> the VSD was found to be 15 millimeters wide actually, as opposed to the seven millimeter uh, on echo. And clearly now we know that it, is, it was probably also contributing to additional volume overload on top of the AI itself. So the issue of the VSD, the discussion whether to close it or not, is because when you have a VSD and you want to close it, it's the perimembrane specifically, it's close to the normal conduction system of the heart. So uh, maybe closing, suturing it during surgery can cause AV block or any conduction abnormality. So that's why it was part of the discussion whether to close it or not. Uh, but again, it was large. It was clearly contributing to the volume, to the extra volume, so it was closed. Again, careful intraoperative uh, inspection of the valve confirmed a quadricuspid uh, valve, as we have seen before, and the deformed cusp was part of, uh, of that quadricusp quadricuspid configuration, and a bioprostatic valve uh, was implanted. So as a conclusion, we present a case in which a large perimembranous VSD was found to be associated with severe AI in a patient presenting with heart failure. The mechanism of AI, however, was a quadricuspid aortic valve morphology with cusp prolapse, this highlights the importance of recognizing different mechanisms by which a VST can be associated with AI. It would be cusp prolapse. Usually the main mechanism is cusp prolapse in perimembranous or subpulmonary or concomitant aortic valve uh, uh, abnormality, as I said before, in perimembranous VSTs. And since the left ventricle is double volume overloaded, if you can say that, a careful follow-up in patients with VST and AI is very important for the prevention of heart failure later in life. These are the references and the disclosures and some videos I added just to appreciate uh, the case. So you can see here. No, I'm gonna have it on I'm gonna have it on iPad, the videos just to in case someone asked to Exactly, so that's why, so, and I showed like, uh, you can see here, for example, on this specifically here, this, you, can see, you can see the RVOT and the pulmonary valve, so if you have, uh, if, you, uh, if you have a really cusp prolapse as the mechanism of AI, the cusp should prolapse into the RVOT, uh, which you don't see on this, actually, you see the prolapse going into the, back into the LVOT. So this clearly shows that that's not uh, the mechanism was quadricuspid aortic valve, the AI. That's not actually uh, the, the VSD itself causing the AI. And that, that was uh, confirmed in surgery anyway. So the next case is, the title is Successful Management of Acute Salmonella Aeroiditis. So um, unfortunately, I cannot surprise you with the end diagnosis, but we'll try to go through the thought process that we had. Um, Aortic syndromes are uh, an issue in the emergency medicine setting. They do require rapid dis diagnosis and decision making. We are quite familiar with the whole spectrum, but we have to keep in mind that there are uh, less uh, frequent etiologies that need to be picked up because they require a specific management. So this particular case was the case of a 68-year-old man that presented to an outside hospital complaining of shortness of breath, back pain, and a week or so uh, duration of flu-like symptoms with fever. He was febrile in the emergency department, blood cultures were drawn, and images were suspicious of aortic dissection, so the patient was transferred to TASF Medical Center. In the emergency department, as the images were not considered to be absolutely diagnostic, we had a repeated TEE and a CT chest. And on a TEE that you can see here, we can appreciate, well, it's not moving, but I can assure you that the valve was functioning well. We have thickened aortic walls that are kind of hyperlucent. And on the short axis, we can appreciate, again, the thickened walls with some color that's kind of hinting at hitting that walls, but without an actual color flow, showing flow within the thickened wall. And uh, no flap or no obvious flap was seen at this point. 
the CT chest show exactly the same picture, so thickened aortic walls with the ulcer-like projections that is depicted by the red arrow there. Uh, this uh, aortic disease was extending in the ascending aorta without going down to the descending, and the initial lesion was thought to be like two centimeters above the sinotubular junction. The patient was hemodynamically stable. Uh, intramural hematoma was our working diagnosis, and the patient was also deemed too high risk for open heart surgery. He was hypertensive, alcoholic, diabetic. He had very bad perivascular disease, status post left leg amputation at this point. So he was hospitalized, and aggressive medical management was started with blood pressure control, pain control, and of course a watchful waiting strategy that was implanted in place. On the further walk up, the patient kept complaining of severe back pain that was chronic but was really worsening compared to his baseline. So a spinal MRI was obtained and showed, as shown in the circle there, a multifocal osteomyelitis involving segment from T8 to T10 and also some hint of a paravertebral abscess. On a follow-up transthoracic echo, we found a new onset pericardial effusion the effusion was moderate in size and was circumferential. The patient was hemodynamically stable at this point, and we had no hint on a transthoracic that some kind of hemodynamic impact of the pericardial effusion. Nevertheless, these new findings were consistent with a different diagnosis at this point, and we needed to rework our initial idea. In the meantime, blood cultures came back positive from the day one for uh, negative rods, gram-negative rods. So at this point, our differential needed to change, and we were facing basically uh, aortic dissection or an aortitis with a rapidly evolving aortic aneurysm. Again, the CT scan that was repeated at this point showed a progression of the intramural hematoma, and as you can see by the red arrow there, an increase in size of the ulcer light projection. As microbiology came back to us saying, hey, you know what, the gram-negative rods are salmonella species, uh, our differential diagnosis, in our differential diagnosis, the mycotic aortic aneurysm actually bumped up to be on the first place in this case. So, of course, the patient, again, was stable at this point, but his, the likelihood of the surgeons taking him to the operating room was a, no higher compared to baseline. So, again, um, a fairly complicated multidisciplinary re-evaluation re led us to the decision of performing an intravascular procedure. And so an uh, ascending aortic graft but was positioned on a, with a TAVR procedure. And this went well. Uh, the patient was discharged to rehabilitation 15 days later on long-term antibiotics and was doing well one year post-discharge. Uh, so briefly on the key points in the case, um, intramural hematoma is part of the aortic syndrome spectrum. Compared to the other classic diagnosis of acute aortic dissection or even penetrating ulcer, has a 30% chance of progressing and a 30% chance of being reabsorbed. So in high-risk patients, a watchful wait waiting strategy can actually be pursued. Uh, in the case of a, suspicious, a suspicion for infective aortitis, the presence of salmonella species as the culprit actually increases the risk of dissection and progression with a catastrophic outcome for the patient. Um, without intervention, mortality is close to 90% in these patients. Risk factors for salmonella are both host-related and uh, pathogen-related, and in the host-related factors, we need to remember status of immunosuppression, male gender, age uh, greater than 55, and atherosclerotic disease. And this is because salmonella species are uh, particularly keen in seeding into the damaged endothelium. The treatment gold standard, as we know, is surgical debridement, so open heart surgery that carries a high mortality risk. Um, however, uh, less invasive or endovascular repair has been attempted, even in mycotic aneurysm, and are, have been proved to be effective with lower intraoperative mortality, even though they do carry a high risk of complication of recurrence, basically because you're putting a stent into a tissue that, of course, is not sterile at this point. Um, the fact that the patient has, at the time of surgery, hemodynamic stability and blood negative culture are kind of factors that favor a good outcome in this context. So just keep in mind that the first diagnosis might not be necessarily your uh, end one. Thank you.
we didn't we didn't find evidence of endo of endocarditis. Um, so we thought that the severe atherosclerosis that the patient had actually was a contributor of the seeding of the salmonella. So it was kind of a better place for the salmonella to be to start the infection the aorta compared to his uh, cardiac valves. Well, we had blood cultures positive on day one, and the following cultures that were obtained during hospitalization were then negative. So we cannot say for sure that the first culprit was uh, the aortitis or the osteomyelitis. We couldn't figure things out from that point of view. But having three different foci of infection basically at this time made our diagnosis, like differential diagnosis, kind of uh, easier. Uh, it can be done. Um, I'm not sure that the specificity would be high enough to be able to differentiate from an infection inflammation compared to just inflammation that comes from the damage of the endothelium. Will this patient be on lifelong antibiotics? Likely, yes. Yes, it was tested for the HIV and um, a lot of other things, but was tested negative. We thought that his um, global debilitation and his being an alcoholic uh, was part of that his immunosuppression uh, situation. So yes, you usually well, salmonella is usually a GI infection. We have one million cases of salmonella species. Of those patients that have a GI infection with salmonella, 10% develop bacteremia. And of those 10%, 5 to 10% develop a cardiovascular involvement. So it's rare, but it does exist. Why, why do they not do surgery? I mean, you put a prosthetic in a abscess. Or yes. Um, the surgeon just said, no way. And it's hard to argue with that. <laughs> willing to do the, the procedure, but we didn't find one, so. Yep. No. But it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not an odd question at all. Uh, salmonella is, um, higher, has a higher prevalence in sickle cell disease patient. Uh, that would be more true for a pediatric population. Uh, I'm not sure that sickle cell in adult patient has the same type of uh, distribution as prevalence goes. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to present um, the abstract for the ACC conference. The title is uh, 3D printed uh, uh, patient specific multimaterial uh, modeling of mitral valve apparatus. So um, the CT images uh, has been uh, successfully used already for, uh, for the modeling of the mitral valve leaflets. Um, but however, the entire mitral valve apparatus hasn't been uh, reconstructed yet. We have also reported already uh, that um, uh, the approximate mechanical properties of the 3D print materials uh, can um, uh, approximate the mechanical properties of the mitral tissue. Uh, the, in, within this, uh, this work, uh, we sought to uh, replicate uh, the entire mitral valve uh, apparatus uh, and to 3D print it uh, using multi-material 3D printing technology. Uh, the objectives will be to replicate the um, uh, digital models of the mitral apparatus both in uh, systole and diastole and uh, eventually to, uh, to perform the benchtop mitral clip uh, procedure. Um, we were able to replicate the uh, the mitral valve apparatus, but uh, in systo from systolic and uh, diastolic images. Uh, in a um, systo systolic model, we were able to replicate nicely uh, the mitral prolapse and the subvalvular uh, apparatus and to uh, 3D printed it. Then in the systolic models, we have identified uh, the major uh, elements of the mitral apparatus, uh, annulus, leaflets, cordae, and the papillary muscles, and uh, 3D printed them. Uh, we have also verified those models uh, by uh, measuring the characteristic uh, lengths 
such as uh, stratocordi, uh, mitral annulus uh, area, um, posterior, uh, anterior, uh, posterior uh, diameter and um, mediolateral diameters, and compare them with um, uh, th those values in the uh, clinical CT images, and they compared well. Um, the differences were uh, 2 to 2.5%. Uh, uh, eventually, we have uh, implanted the microclip um, device into our diastolic uh, model. And uh, we can conclude that uh, uh, CT images could be used for the replication of the entire mitral valve apparatus and uh, can be 3D printed using uh, multi-material 3D printing technology. The materials that we have selected uh, for those models, uh, all of the, uh, the deformation and conformal changes of the mitral annulus and leaflets and uh, all of the implantation of the mitral clip device, eventually we can tell that uh, those, uh, those models have potential to be uh, clinical tools for the simulation and uh, for the uh, planning of the, of the structural uh, heart valve um, uh, procedures. And uh, the next step uh, for this work will be to uh, implant those, um, those models in the uh, pressurized flow loop and to uh, replicate the clinical hemodynamic conditions. Thank you. Uh, that means uh, that we have uh, 3D printed those uh, models uh, with the different, uh, actually the each uh, material, uh, millimeter leaflet, uh, uh, annulus, um, uh, cordae and uh, papillary muscles were 3D printed of different materials that were selected upon a, a previously um, measured mechanical properties of mitral tissue. Uh, yeah, we selected the uh, mater different materials for each mitral element. Um, so why does it matter? Why not just use the same material for the annulus, for the leaflets, for the organ? Uh, because uh, they have, the, it, it has been reported that the, actually they have different mechanical properties, different uh, elasticity and uh, uh, elastic modulus. So we try to actually replicate those uh, uh, theoretical and uh, values that we have found in literature. Would you be able to sort of measure the elasticity of this and then compare it to a normal? Exactly. This is actually the, the work in, proj uh, in progress that we are doing uh, with the collaborators at Rice University. So we are actually testing the, uh, each element, like uh, mitral leaflets, uh, cordae, and uh, papillary muscles. We are performing the mechanical testing of them, and then uh, we are also testing the, the series of different material and material composites uh, to actually approximate those um, uh, material uh, properties of the, of the mitral tissue. Yes, for this. Uh, actually, this is uh, the prolapse, prolapse one. Yes. Would it be different if you were to say model a normal valve from this? Um, let's say maybe in terms of the material selection, I think we would initially uh, uh, select the same materials, but uh, actually in the in the future we will try to determine which material to use for the uh, abnormal walls and which one to use actually for the normal ones. Why did you, you choose CT instead of KT? <laughs> uh, basically, for this particular project, uh, the high-resolution CT images were more appropriate for the uh, reconstruction of the cordae. But uh, we have also used uh, uh, previously the uh, 3D T images uh, to reconstruct mitral leaflets and recently also the cordae um, reconstruction. But it is because of the higher resol spatial resolution. I don't want to take the chance from other people to ask questions. It's a lot of nice work and a lot of questions come up. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, actually, uh, in our previous work uh, that was related to uh, aortic stenosis, we have created uh, the uh, left ventricle also, and uh, it was created uh, of the flexible materials. Um, under the pressurized uh, conditions, these uh, models are a little bit fragile, so it can create uh, problems uh, under high pressures. So basically, we uh, changed this and uh, went to the um, actual more um, uh, stiff, stiff materials for the ventricle. But um, uh, in the future, I think, uh, in the future work, that it will be related to the um, uh, replication of mitral clip uh, 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 hemodynamic conditions, I think we will uh, incorporate uh, and we will study actually material properties that can replicate also the, the elasticity of the ventricle. Um, let's say it uh, depends on the uh, really resolution of the images. If the images has a really high resolution, then this uh, reconstruction can go from two to three hours, but it can also go more because uh, in order to uh, really be sure that we are replicating the patient-specific uh, subvalvular uh, sub apparatus, uh, sometimes you have to reconstruct both uh, the systolic and diastolic uh, model and to co-register them to make sure that we have uh, uh, reconstructed each chordae. We are also um, uh, kind of um, color coding those chordae and the, to make sure that, that uh, the reconstruction is fully patient specific. But uh, it can go from two hours to even eight hours or so. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, for example, uh, in this particular model, uh, it was easier to reconstruct actually the diastolic model because the cooptation zone is more visible. Um, but the chorda were easier to reconstruct uh, from the systolic uh, systolic model. So we have uh, uh, superimposed actually those models to make sure that uh, we are uh, modeling both uh, both both um, uh, systolic and diastolic. Uh, model correctly. So the way you are satisfied that your model is at the end, say if it was dynamically for a bell there, you end up with a similar? Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. We measured uh, uh, like physically uh, in the model, the 3D printed model, and then we measured it also in the clinical CT images, and the comparison was quite, quite good. Uh, for now, we are using a standard uh, and the smallest uh, slice thickness, but uh, with Dr. Cheng, probably in the future, we are going to really characterize the, um, the most appropriate uh, uh, imaging parameters for the reconstruction. No, we are using a, a, a MIMIC software that is a kind of a design-based uh, uh, software.